Where does man come from? Why is he here? And where are we headed? The answer to these questions can be found in the Bible. Explore the Bible and the answer to these questions with us on ION TV at 6.30 on Saturday morning. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me And with the sunlight of His love bid all my darkness flee Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today Sunlight, sunlight all along the way since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of His love within. Hello, my name is Jay Borg, and I'm a part-time evangelist and a partner with the Church of Christ located at 1551 East 8th Street in Mesa, Arizona. Our meeting times are on Sunday at 9.30 and 10.30 in the morning, and again at 6 p.m., and on Wednesday, we meet for Bible study at 7 p.m. I may be reached at 480-981-9794. My email address is jborg at cox.net. Our website address is cfcmesa.com. Welcome to Bible Truths. Today's lesson is titled Original Sin. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, and I'd like to invite you to follow along. I'd like to introduce this lesson by reading Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. Many people go to this passage to say that we're guilty of Adam's sin. But do we? There's much controversy in this subject. And so we're going to examine this. Do we inherit the original sin or Adam's sin? Let's set the context of Romans chapter 5 verse 12 before we read it again. In verses 1 and 2 it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Here we have a book that's written to Christians who says, it says that we're justified by faith. Faith here is the idea of doing enough, doing what, having enough faith to do what God says in order to become a Christian. And God makes this possible by the sacrifice of the Son, Jesus Christ, for our sin. Verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. Notice what this passage says, sin entered the world by one man's sin. And it says why that happened. And sometimes people don't read the end of verse 12. And it gives a reason why death spreads all men. It's because all men sin. But yet people try to say that we inherit the guilt of Adam's sin. But you don't see that in this passage. It doesn't say it here. However, if it does somehow, there are two questions we should ask. When and why does it pass to us then? Some people think that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 21 and 22 answers this question. But we're going to see that it doesn't answer this question. It's actually talking about the physical death. And we're going to read starting in verse 20 to help set the context. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ all shall be made alive. Here we have a passage of speaking where Christ died for our sins and he was risen from the dead, talking about physical death. And we see a connection here with the word for. For as in Adam all die. In other words, we, ha we inherit physical death because of Adam and Eve's sin. Because if Adam and Eve didn't sin, we might still be in the Garden of Eden and have access to the Tree of Life. 
But that's not the case. They sinned and were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And so therefore, we inherit physical death, which is a consequence of Adam's sin. Another passage people teach original sin, or try to, is in Psalm chapter 58, verses 2 through 6. The context here is King David is writing about his displeasure of being pursued by his enemies that are trying to kill him. And you can see why. So there's a little bit of emotion here, which you would expect. Let's read it, starting in verse 2 through 6. No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are strange from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the death cobra that stops its ears, which will not heed the voice of the charmers, charming ever so skillfully. Here we have a description of people who are willfully doing wickedness. And in verse 3 we see a passage that people use try to say that we have inherit original sin. Notice what it says again. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. First of all, it says the wicked are estranged or separated or enemies from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Well, notice first of all, the wicked are enemies from the womb. An infant doesn't have even the ability to be an enemy at that point. He can't even speak. Also, notice the second half of the verse. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. And it connects being born and speaking lies here. Well, an infant can't even speak. They have to learn to speak. So there is no inherited sin here. There's no Adam sin here that's spoken about here that we inherit. Another passage people go to is Psalm 51, verse 5. The context here is King David is dreadfully upset because he just realized he committed a grievous sin. So he's very distraught and it's represented in language like that in the Psalms. The Psalms often have language that are quite exaggerated for effect. But in Psalm 51 verse 5 he says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. When he says brought forth in iniquity, he's talking about the idea, it's the idea of kind of like brought forth in a world of sin, where people sin. And, the latter part of the verse says, And in sin my mother conceived me. It's not talking about his sin. It's talking about his mother's sin. There's nothing in this passage that speaks about inheriting a sin or implying that. Another passage that speaks about that, uh, should we inherit the guilt of our fathers, or we do inherit the guilt of our fathers. In fact, Israel at one time thought this very thing, and Ezekiel answers that question. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, it says, Yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes, and deserved them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Here we have a passage of scripture that talks about who is condemned to sin. Those who sin themselves, not for someone else's sin. It also says that we don't inherit the sins of our father or guilty of the sins of our fathers or our ancestors or Adam's sin. And the context here is Israel had thought that they were in, in captivity, the Babylonian captivity, because of their father's sin. 
And this passage says, no, you are not. If you disagree, read the passage, look at it more carefully, and you'll see it says exactly that. But if for some reason you still disagree, here's a question for your consideration. Is it really fair to hold you responsible for someone else's sin? If you say yes, then I suggest that we might look at another passage in Psalm 89 and verse 14, speaking about the justice of God, where it says, The righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Notice what the passage says. The foundation of God Almighty's throne is based on what? Righteousness and justice. That means God is extremely fair. And so, if you still hold the original sin, are you prepared to say that God is unjust? Because that's the implication. Let's go on. Another argument people make in regard to those who hold to original sin that some make is that we have a sinful nature. But do we? Let's look at what the scripture says about that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, we have a book that's written by King Solomon, considered the wisest man that ever lived, with the exception of Jesus Christ, possibly, speaking about when men die. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. The dust here is referring to our physical being, and the Spirit is what makes up man. And that's what we're primarily concerned with, is our spirit. And who gave us our spirit? God did. In other words, that implies we are his offspring. Another passage people sometimes like to go to in regards to this subject, if we have a sp sinful nature, is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I'd like to read that. It's written by the Apostle Paul, and it's written to Christians. And it's speaking about how they were dead in sin and that they practice sin in their lives willfully. And in you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the, our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Here we have a passage that speaks about God made us alive from our sin. He made it possible by his sacrifice. And he speaks about those who once walked in sin. These were people who weren't Christians before. Now they are. And why were they doing that? Because they were practicing sin, willfully practicing sin. As spoken in verse 3, Among whom also we all once conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So here we have a passage that speaks about, in context, of people willfully practicing sin. And it became their nature because they consistently practiced that. And if we look at the word nature here in the Greek, the original Greek language, that's exactly what it means. It means doing something, feeling or doing something long enough where it becomes a practice or a habit. And nowhere does it say here that we're born as sinners. Now, I want to bring your attention to the NIV version, the New International Version. There's a reason for that. Sometimes this version is not entirely honest. They're biased in their interpretation of certain passages. They translate it incorrectly, and they do so knowingly it's wrong. Let's look what it says in the NIV version. 
all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. The, there's a word that they've added here. Because if they are translating it correctly, they would not put this word in here. They've added the word sinful in connection with the word nature. The original language in the Greek, the Koine Greek, does not have this word. It's something the translators have added because they have a bias and they believe in original sin. And so they've added to the scripture when it's not there. Okay, you, Jay, you could say that, Jay, that's just your opinion. Well, it's not just my opinion. The New King James Version, which I just quoted out of that, does not have that in the scripture. Neither does the Old King James, which is considered an extremely reliable version. And also the American Standard Version does not have that word in there either. And that's also considered a very, very good version of the Bible. I'm not saying the NIV version is, is bad altogether. It just has a certain biasness in that direction as far as Calvinist type ideas. Another passage that people go to is back in Romans in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Actually they go to chapter 3 verses 9 through 18 and they try to say that we have a sinful nature based on this passage. And if you're not careful with the context of this, you might believe that also. And it could be easily done. The book of Romans, therefore, is more important to understand the context because it's a deep book. It's involved. So the context of Romans is trying to prove that the Gentiles are just as acceptable to God as the Jewish Christians are. In other words, the Gentiles don't need to become sort of like a Jew in order to be God's people. That's the idea. And we need to keep that in mind in reading Romans. Let's look at Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 18. And what shall we say then? Are we better than they? Meaning Jew and Gentile. And it says, no, the Jews are not better than, all, better than the Gentiles. He says, not at all. For we have previously charged both who? Jews and Greeks. Greeks is another word for Gentiles. That they are all under sin. Why? Because all men sin. Jew and Gentile. Then it goes on as is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does not does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What we need to understand here, we have a comparison between the Gentiles and the Jews here. In chapter 2, it makes that comparison. And we see in chapter 2, verse 14, a passage that speaks about the righteousness of the Gentiles. In verse 14, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things contained in the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves. Do you realize what's being spoken of? Here you have people, the Gentiles, were not God's people, and yet by nature they did what was contained in the law, suggesting that they were created good from the very beginning. Or at least they were taught that, because that's what the word means in the Greek, that they were taught to obey the law or characteristics. And so they tended to believe that and practice that. And then you have the contrast here in chapter 2 where the Jews who had the law, the law of Moses, they had the written law and the Gentiles didn't have the written law. 
And so the Jews had it and they should have known better and yet they broke God's law consistently. So when chapter 3 comes along and he speaks, reminds the Jews that they were godless. They gave up on God. They didn't believe in God. They disregarded what he had to say. And so that's why he says, are they better than they? No. Not at all. For Jews and Greeks, they are all under sin. Romans 3, verse 9. This is important to understand that. So the idea is, when people are taught to practice righteousness, they tend to follow that. They tend to do that. But on the other hand, if people are taught to do wrong, they have a tendency to do that also. It's kind of like the idea of the struggle that Christians have, the lust of the flesh, and knowing what God wants, pleasing God. You know, the mind tells us we should do this, but we have certain desires and we have to fight that sometimes. So what else does the Bible say in regards to the nature of man? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, now the book of Genesis was written by probably Moses. Many years after creation. Now Genesis chapter 1 is about the creation of the world and it summarizes that. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 it, tell, it says this about man. It says that we were created in the image of God. In other words, we were created good. Well people might say well that was before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Okay, you might have a point there. But the problem is Scripture also talks about man being good after the fall. And where does it say that, you might ask, Jay? Well, in James chapter 3, verse 9, it says that man is made in the similitude, which means likeness, of God. In other words, good. Well, Jay, maybe that's just an a off-the-wall passage and you're misunderstanding that. I don't think so, but let's look. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29. Let's go there for a minute. This is a book that is written by King Solomon, who's considered the wisest man that ever lived. And he is speaking about everything under the sun, every subject that is. And he says this, Truly this only I have found, that God made man upright. In other words, upright is another word for righteous, correct, or just. So, in other words, God made man righteous or good because God is good. Now, if this isn't true, how come sometimes non-Christians feel good when they do something that they know is nice? Well, because it's part of their nature that they do good things. Or how come sometimes it's such a joy about being around babies if they're so depraved or so evil or not good? Other passages on this subject that we might consider is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 where it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. From their sins. Not Adam's sin, but their sins. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, we have a passage that speaks about having our sins blotted out or not remembered anymore. If Adam's sins still exist, then how is it possible for us to have forgiveness of sins? Then God is, in other words, of our sins, then God would be still remembering it. So in other words, if our sins are blotted out, and if Adam still exists, then God is still remembering it. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 9, we have a passage that speaks about the Apostle Paul and his state in life. At one point, it says, Paul was alive without the law. How is that possible? He's alive without the law. Well, when he was an infant, he didn't know the law. He couldn't possibly know the law. He had to learn the law. If he was alive without the law, how is it possible he was born with original sin? Doesn't seem possible. Another passage we might look at is Colossians chapter 3. 
and verses 9 and 10. Written to Christians, speaking about what they're supposed to do. And starting in verse 9, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. It says, first of all, to get rid of the old man, the Christians, voluntarily, that they need to do that themselves, and put on the new man. And, he says, how this was in the knowledge, according to who? According to the image of him who created him or renewed in the image. The re back to the original state is the implication. If the original station was bad, then this passage doesn't make any sense. Another possible problem of this understanding of original sin is people practice infant baptism. And that's why infant baptism is done. It's because they believe that babies are guilty of the original sin. Well, are you willing to say that hell awaits them if they don't get baptized then? And another implication of that position is that that's suggesting that someone else is responsible for that baby's salvation. Now, how fair is that? What if their parents didn't do that? That's not fair. And we know that God is very fair, as discussed earlier. Also, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. It speaks about knowing God. We're we'll start in verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. It says those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord will be punished. Not those who aren't capable of it, in Mark 16, 16, it says, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. It doesn't say who can't believe and be baptized. So who are we going to believe? We're going to believe this doctrine of original sin? Or are we going to believe the scriptures? Now I know some people may not believe that because they believe in original sins. But I encourage you to examine the scriptures closely because your salvation is dependent on knowing the truth. We want to thank you for listening today and we'd like to invite you to catch our show again sometime. My name is David Baker and I preach for the 8th Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona. I hold in my hand the Bible. It's the Word of God. In the Bible we find the answers to the great questions of life. Where we came from, where we're headed, and why we're here. We'd like to explore these questions and the answers that you find in the Bible with you at 6.30 in the morning on ION TV. Please join us, won't you?